like to very um, uh, warmly welcome you all to this evening's event. It's the last of our online local interest talks for 2021. Uh, and it's uh, a really um, my pleasure to have you all with me this evening. As uh, you may know, my name is Zoe, Zoe Toft. I'm chair of a charity called Folio Sutton Coldfield, and what we do is support uh, the public libraries in Sutton Coldfield by promoting them, by encouraging you to visit them, uh, encouraging you to join them if you're not already a member, uh, and um, highlighting the resources uh, that they have available for us all to use. Without further ado, I will uh, very warmly welcome our speaker for this evening, and that's um, uh, Peter Coxhead. Now, Peter Coxhead spent many years in, working in academia in computer science, but he now fills his days um, uh, rather brilliantly <laughs> when I was looking at it uh, in, in many key roles. So he is secretary of the Sutton Coldfield Natural History Society. He is treasurer of the Birmingham Natural History Society, and he is the vice chair uh, of the Birmingham group of Alpine Garden. So um, he, he could almost form a, a board of trustees all on his own, <laughs> couldn't you, Peter? So I thought that was quite, quite brilliant, but uh, for, for three different very interesting organisations. Um, uh, he's an enthusiastic photographer. One of his particular passions is orchids. Uh, but tonight he's going to be talking to us uh, about the wildlife of Sutton Park. And before um, I hand over to him, I just want to say um, a particular thank you to him because what he's done is he's um, stood in for a previously advertised speaker. We had hoped originally to bring you Martin Fisher to talking about the birds of Sutton Park, but unfortunately Martin's been uh, rather poorly with COVID. Uh, I'm delighted to let you know that he's now at home uh, and beginning uh, on the road to recovery, but um, I'm sure you'll join me in wishing Martin uh, a full and speedy recovery. And also in thanking uh, very sincerely Peter for uh, stepping into the breach and uh, preparing a brand new talk. Nobody has ever heard this talk from Peter before, even though he, he delivers many talks. Um, so we're, we're lucky recipients tonight um, of Peter's generosity uh, and knowledge. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Peter and he will tell us all about the recording of the wildlife in Sutton Park, some history and some highlights. So over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Well, I, I hope you're going to um, enjoy the replacement for the birds of Sutton Park, but we shall see. What I'm talking about tonight is recording the wildlife of Sutton Park. I don't mean making sound recordings. I mean keeping records, making records and studying the wildlife of Sutton Park. Um, my, just a quick acknowledgement at the beginning, you're not expected to read this screen and they won't look like this again, but I'm just pointing out that I'm a photographer, sure, but I mostly take photographs of flowers. So in order to be able to show you many of the animals of Sutton Park, which is what I'll be mostly talking about tonight, I have used a lot of pictures from Wikimedia Commons and the copyright remains with the original, although they're free to use. So um, I'm just putting that up for information. Okay, my talk is in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to look at the history of recording wildlife in Sutton Park. And then in the second part, I'm going to show you some selected spe species. So first of all, we're going to look at the history of recording, wildlife recording in Sutton Park. I suppose we should always begin by asking the question why? I mean, why bother to record wildlife? I mean, maybe it's interesting to real enthusiasts like me, but why is it important to record the wildlife? And the answer is evidence. Records of wildlife are really important as evidence which help to support the status of the park. Sutton Park is both in the jargon a triple SI, which is a site of special scientific interest, and it's also an NNR, a National Nature Reserve. And attaining the status, both of those statuses, was enormously helped by having continuous records of the wildlife so that we could demonstrate to the relevant people that how important Sutton Park was, how full of interesting species it was. But it's also important to manage the conservation of the park. 
If we don't know what's there now, we can't tell whether they're increasing, decreasing, or, or what's actually going on. I mean, it's, it's simply not possible to tell unless you keep good records. Now, as I, I think most people in, in Sutton will know, the, the origin of Sutton Park is as a medieval deer park. Um, we can assume that the, the, those who looked after the deer park would have recorded the stock of deer, and they probably might have recorded other things that they were interested in. For example, the pools were used to rear fish, and I'm sure they kept records of that. But if they did, we don't really know that much about it. The first really systematic recording by, by modern standards of recording came with James Bagnall in 1876. Um, I won't say too much about Bagnell. He's a very interesting figure. And if you are interested in him, you can look up the relevant page in Wikipedia. There's a, a page on James Eustace Bagnell. Um, so he wrote, well, first of all, he gave a presentation to the Birmingham Natural History Society in 1876. And then that presentation was actually published by the Birmingham Natural History Society um, as a separate publication. It only covers the plants because that was Bagnall's interest. There are about 120 species of moss and about 500 species of other plants. The reason why there are lots of moths, mosses is because Bagnall, in fact, wrote a major British handbook to mosses, which, which was used for many years, in, including after his death. Um, in fact, about a quarter of all the plants, all the mosses and other plants that were known to Bagnall to be on the British list were recorded in Sutton Park. And that tells you something about its importance even then. Okay, about a quarter of all the plants at that time known in the whole of the British Isles were recorded in Sutton Park by James Bagnall. He describes just a little bit about uh, what he said. He describes the park in glowing terms. He was in fact, he lived in, in Birmingham. Um, he was a clerk in a, a pen works um, in, in his full-time job, but then he went out in his leisure time and studied natural history. Eventually, in fact, he became a fellow of the Linnaean Society. He was so knowledgeable. And he used to walk from the center of Birmingham out to Sutton Park, which in those days meant that when he left um, uh, the center and went through Erdington, after that, really, it was open countryside. And he describes the park, I'm sure you've read what it says there, as being very wild. But he hated the railway. He was one of the people who had campaigned against the railway being allowed to go through the park. There were others as well. And I will read what he says there because it's well worth repeating. He said, we might well exclaim here, nature reigns supreme, were it not that we see an ugly ridge of sand and gravel with here and there an unsightly looking blue brick bridge. Our grand old park has been invaded. Well, we might have slightly different views today because, in fact, some interesting plants grow on those blue brick bridges. But still, um, it, it was an invasion uh, on uh, a park that was at that time undisturbed. So the flora, the, the plants and the fungi of Sutton Park, they've continued to be very well recorded since Bagnall's day. And I've just listed a few here. There was a flora produced in 71. Um, all the fungi were included in a fungus for of Warwickshire. Harold Fawkes and I produced a natural history in 97, um, uh, when we produced part one on the vascular plants. Um, there's been a recent work done on the lichens, and you had a, we had a talk in, from, in the folio series of talks from Ian Truman um, on a new floor of Sutton Park, which is due in 2022. Animals of all kinds have been much less well recorded than the plants, at least in published works. 
1896, the Birmingham Natural History Society did publish an account of the vertebrate fauna, but only the vertebrate fauna, the vertebrate animals of the Sutton Coalfield area by, by J. Steele Elliott. Um, and that included the park, but his account doesn't always make it clear whether the animals he's recording were found in the park or, or outside it. We can make guesses in many cases. And a small number of records for Sutton Coalfield, again as a whole, not distinguishing clearly between Sutton Coalfield and the park, are included in a 1904 volume of the Victoria County History for Warwickshire. Um, I don't know whether you know, but there was a project which began around the turn of that century um, to document all the counties um, in England and the Victoria County history for Warwickshire. There's one volume in 1904 and there, there are further volumes. And looking at those records, in some cases, we can assume that those species must have occurred in the park. We know that the habitat that they, um, that they preferred really only occurred in Sutton Park. I don't know whether anyone has been to the Birmingham Museum's collection center. Um, it's an, ab if you ever get the chance to go, they have an open day, I think once a year, but obviously with, with COVID, it hasn't been happening recently, but it's an amazing place. They have a huge amount of material, far, far more than could ever be put in, in, in the actual museums. And it's where they keep all of their, their sort of back stock. And in particular, they, they have a natural history section where they have notebooks, specimens, specimens including stuffed animals um, and uh, captured butterflies and beetles and all sorts of things. And they have these specimens for a number of early collectors. And these normally have locations attached so that you can tell where they were collected. Um, two important ones for the park are R.C. Bradley, who mostly collected butterflies and moths in the late 1800s, many of them in Sutton Park, and S.E.W. Carlier, who collected beetles, um, really from about 1910 onwards. So by going, well, we don't necessarily have to go there, but by looking at their catalogues, we, we can record things that were found early on in Sutton Park. And also a local naturalist, Les Evans, um, studied the butterflies and moths of Sutton Park for many years, particularly from the 1940s through to the 1980s. And he amassed a very large collection of specimens, butterflies, um, you know, pinned on boards and preserved. Um, so there, there's all of these are good records, but they weren't published. There were no actual booklets which included or, or books that included these lists. Probably the one of the earliest booklet that really includes a, a, quite a bit about the natural history of, of Sutton Park, some of you may have seen this or even have a copy, is a 1965 booklet by John Field and Peter James, they, they were both members of the Sutton Coalfield Natural History Society. And um, this included a chapter on the natural history of Sutton Park. And it did have notes on animals of all kinds, most particularly the birds. It, it had a good list of birds. The list of birds was intended to be complete, um, unlike the notes on the other animals. So, there's a nice little illustration of some of the birds that have been seen in the park, uh, drawn by David Astin, also a member of the Sutton Coalfield Natural History Society at that time. Um, oh, well, the, these are the water birds. Um, they recorded 112 species of birds, 56 of which were recorded as actually having bred in the park, so that they produced young and, and bred in the park. So to that extent, you could say they were native to the park, 112 species. As I say, there were notes on other groups of animals. There were some notes on, um, but if you've got the booklet, you'll know there were notes on, on butterflies and moths, but they were not comprehensive in, in the same way that they were um, for the birds. The birds were really the best recorded in, in that publication. 
Much more recently, there have been two funded surveys of the invertebrates of the park. So re really supplementing the very early 1896 uh, record of the vertebrates of the Sutton Coalfield area and the stuff in this 1965 booklet, which was mainly on, on birds. There were some mentions of mammals as well and other things. But there have been two surveys of the invertebrates of the park, um, which have been strongly supported by Natural England, the one of the bodies that's concerned with um, awarding the status of National Nature Reserve and um, upholding that status, managing the park so that it remains a National Nature Reserve. And Stephen Falk and Associates have carried out these two funded surveys in 1996 to 1998 with Steve Lane and in 2018, 2019 with uh, Chris Kirk be or Kirby, sorry, Lambert. Um, the only thing I would say about these amazing surveys, and we'll see in a bit that there's a huge number of records, is that one of the problems with any biological recording is that the records that you get depend on the interests of the recorders. Steve Lane is particularly interested in hoverflies and other flies. Um, sorry, not Steve Lane, sorry. Stephen Falk is particularly interested in hoverflies and other flies. Steve Lane was very interested in beetles. Chris Kirby Lambert had a wider set of interests and, and did some quite good work on the spiders, which we'll come back to. But it, it does mean that we have really brilliant records of flies and hoverflies. Um, simply because we, we have the real British expert on hoverflies doing the recording. In recent years, the rangers in the park have run two-day events called bio blitzes. Um, as the name suggests, the idea is that intensively a blitz takes place over a short period in which you try to go out and record as much wildlife as you can. And the way that these have been organized has been that <clears throat> on one day, the Friday, we've had school children, uh, I've gone along to assist. We've had school children in the park um, accompanied by their teachers. And then on the second day, the, the public has been invited. And there was a bio blitz recently this year, but of course we weren't able, because of COVID, we weren't able to, um, to involve the schools. And the school children are great because we equip them um, with nets and gadgets to collect things. And we go, for example, into um, an open field area and they run about enthusiastically with their nets, catching all sorts of things which they bring back and we try to identify. Um, they do pond dipping where they're given, again, nets and they go out and um, dip in the in the streams and on the edges of some of the pools. Um, and we go into the woodland as well in the same way doing collecting. And it, it's amazing how effective um, a, a party of school children are at finding things that um, we, we haven't found before. And then after that, we have walks for the public. Again, some of you may have come to those events and um, we also have experts um, from around the area who come and do some of their own surveying. And they've been very interesting in generating some new records of animals. I have to say that as a plant person, uh, I slightly regret the fact that the school children are not really very interested in the plants. Um, then again, still sticking to the history and how, how we got, how, how did I get involved? How, how did I get to where I am now in terms of um, recording natural history and being interested in the records. Well, in the late 1980s, I was then, the, as I still am, the secretary of the Sutton Coalfield Natural History Society, and Harold Fawkes, a retired, then a retired um, headmaster of a junior school, was the president of the society. And it was really his idea that we should try to publish booklets, checklists of all the wildlife of the park, all of it, 
not just the plants as had been well recorded before, but also everything, the animals, the invertebrates, the vertebrates, fungi, everything, lichens, everything. Um, my, I mean, I was interested in the plants as a, an amateur botanist and a plant enthusiast, but I guess my role was that professionally I was, as Zoe told you at the beginning, um, a computer scientist. So it, it was something that I could prepare databases, spreadsheets with lists, and you know I could actually um, do the desktop publishing and so on to produce the booklets. Um, Harold was the person who had really, really detailed knowledge of the park, which he'd been studying for many, many years. And we did manage to produce between us three booklets which covered the plants, the fungi and the birds between 1991 and 1997. Um, I'm going to ignore the plants and fungi today because um, as I've already said, you, you did have a, an excellent talk from Professor Ian Truman about the plants, the, the new flora. Um, the paper versions of these three booklets are actually now replaced by online versions. And if you're interested, there's a, a website. Um, if you search for the Sutton Coalfield Natural History Society, you can find links to the SPNH, which stands for Sutton Park Natural History, um, sort of sub, sub web pages. Um, but the, we did sell quite a lot of copies of these booklets through the um, visitor center and again there may be people uh, present tonight who who've actually have one or more of them um, so just as an example the the as i'm not talking about the plants but the third booklet was on the birds of the park this was published in 1995 um, um, harold and i edited it between us but it was actually written by most of it anyway was written by stefan bodner who was at the time um, involved with the park, was a, a ranger and later became a planning, um, involved in, in natural history planning um, for the city council. And his, his interest was in both birds and in the mammals. So it was largely written by Stefan, who was then a park ranger, um, although he did get assistance from the Arnold brothers as they're known in, in um, birding circles, George and Morris Arnold, um, who were long time recorders of birds of the West Midland area. 181 species were listed, rather more than, than in the 1965 booklet, and about 15 more species were considered unconfirmed. That is, we suspected they were there and some people had reported it, but we weren't certain that, um, it, that, you know, that they were correct records. Um, and we have some rather nice drawings um, in the booklet by Vanessa Nixon. This is a wheat ear, um, a, a bird of heathland areas. We did intend to produce a fourth booklet, which would have covered animals from mollusks to mammals, all of the animals really, not, not, not just the vertebrates, not just you know, things that you might think of as animals, but every, all kinds of animals, birds excluded of course, because we'd already produced a booklet. And we did intend to produce a fourth booklet and indeed we, we had it prepared. I mean, the cover is here and we, we had some text all, all worked out. And Howard and I, as with the other booklets, we, we acquired many records from different sources. A lot in those days came from the Warwick Museum or the Warwickshire Museum because the Biological Records Centre at the Warwick Museum um, was the place that records for the old county of Warwickshire were kept. And for continuity of recording, particularly for plants, perhaps less so these days for animals, but particularly for plants, records were kept by the old counties, which are now called vice counties. Um, and indeed, the, the plants are still recorded by the old VC38 is what used to be most Warwickshire. However, the problem was that in 1999, as we were really getting ready to sort of finalize this, 
This first report by Steve Falk and Steve Lane appeared, and it had over two and a half thousand records of invertebrates, many of which were completely new to the park. And really there were two problems. Harold became unable to work on the project as he grew older. Um, so I didn't have any assistance with that. He was wonderful at proofreading. And we, because we had to try and integrate these two and a half thousand records with the existing records and add them to our list. But we also realized that if we produced a booklet comparable to the first three, it would just be unwieldy because the enormous bulk of the booklet would just consist of these thousands of records of invertebrates, of flies and moths and all sorts of things that probably wouldn't really be very interesting to many people and would make the booklet expensive. So what I decided to do when Harold was no longer able to work on the project as a computer scientist was to put the checklists on the web. So the checklist, the actual lists of animals from all four booklets, including the one that was never published, are actually on the web and at the web address I gave you before. And the original text of all of these will, will soon be online as well. The animal records online are in seven lists. Um, there are invertebrates. You can read what's on the screen. I draw your attention to the really large number of uh, diptera, true flies, the largest number of records. Again, that doesn't reflect what's actually in the park, that reflects the interest of the recorder. Um, but there are lots of records of other groups as well. And in total, at the moment, and it's definitely incomplete, I know there are some more records to be added. At the moment, there are 3,636 species listed um, on the website. So what I'll do in a moment is to show you some photos of a personally selected sample. So part two of my talk then, we're going to look at some selected species. And all I can do is to select a few species from the many um, different groups that we've got recorded. But we'll start with the arachnids. Most of the arachnids in the park are spiders. I'll say a little bit about what arachnids are when I get a photograph. The spiders of the park are generally well recorded. Indeed, I could say very well recorded. About 40% of all the spider species ever found in the UK have been listed as occurring in the park, which is quite astonishing. The first really serious recorder of spiders was a guy called Wayne Rickson, particularly between 1991 and 95. And he produced a report which we incorporated into our records. But then the 2018-2019 um, invertebrate survey also included spiders. The, the earlier one didn't, but this big survey did, identified by Chris Kirby Lambert. I give you a warning now that I shall be showing in the next four, I think the next four slides, photographs of spiders. I know that some people do suffer from arachnophobia. So if, if that's your problem, do look away and I'll tell you when I finish showing you pictures of spiders. The cross spider um, is very common in the park. And they start out as small and they get bigger. The females can be about four fifths of an inch long, 20 millimeters in a mature female. They come in a variety of colors. Th this one, this photo I got from Wikimedia Commons, is a, almost a sort of gingery brown. Probably in the park, there are more dull brown than that, more like the, the picture of the underside, more like this sort of color you can see. This is the underside of the female and this is the top side. Just very briefly, what's an arachnid? Well, it's not an insect. One way you can tell the difference is because it has eight legs rather than six. And its body has got only two visible parts, a head and a thorax combined and a big, usually a bigger abdomen. Um, so the cross spider, it's very common in gardens as well. I'm sure that anybody who has a garden would have had the cross spider in their garden at some time. Probably the 
most numerous spider in the park at some times. Well, it'll be there all the while, but it's too small when it's very young, it, it, you won't see them. But in the autumn, this spider, uh, Linifia triangularis, it doesn't seem to have um, an English name. It, it's particularly in the autumn in Sutton Park, it, it's too late now, but in the early autumn, if you had a nice misty day and you walked in the park, you would see flat webs, not vertical webs, but flat webs, particularly on gorse bushes, I find them, but it, it does occur elsewhere. And the spider runs around underneath these flat web. And what happens is there are a scaffolding of threads above the flat sheet and insects get trapped in it. The flying insects hit it and fall down. And the spider runs around underneath the web, strikes upwards through the web and captures its prey. I'm not quite sure what it's actually got here, but you can see that this one has got prey. It's a, it looks big here in this photo. The body is about a quarter of an inch long, something like that, but it has very long legs so that the whole length from the back leg when it's extended to the front leg is probably about an inch and a half. In June 2021, for the very first time in Sutton Park, the ranger, Matt Barker, uh, photographed this spider. It's generally called the Cricket bat, cricket bat spider because, well, you can see why th this marking looks like a cricket bat, although cricket bats don't usually have holes in them. But, you know, it's called the cricket bat spider. And there were no previous records for the old Warwickshire County at all. And there's only one record really in anywhere in, in our region. It's a heather specialist, so it's not surprising it's found in the park and his photo shows it on heather but it's mostly found in Southern England, but it appears to be spreading northwards. And this well, may well be one of these indicators of global warming that we are beginning to get uh, animals and plants as well, but animals that didn't occur in our region that were previously Southern and are making their way northwards. So this is a very exciting record to those of us who are interested in spiders. Okay. If you are an arachnophobe, you can look back now because I finished my spider photos. Um, I mentioned a number of times that the problem with recording sometimes is that the records you get depend on who does the recording. And the insects of the park vary in how well they've been recorded. The blue bars here show you the number of e each of some the groups of insects. So I put um, ants, bees and wasps, hymenopterans, flies, beetles, butterflies and moths, true bugs and all the others. And the blue bars are the actual number of records, proportional to the actual number of records. Now, if we added up the total and rescaled what we would expect if the proportions match the British Isles totals, which of course isn't, we shouldn't necessarily expect that. I mean, Sutton Park's not typical of the whole British Isles, but it gives us some idea. The point is that we should have got many, many, many more wasps, mostly what are parasitic wasps, because in the British Isles as a whole, they make up the largest of the groups of insects and we haven't got anything like enough records. And that's because we haven't had a specialist recording. Whereas we've got really, well, I'm not saying too many, but we were well recorded the flies, more than you'd expect proportionately. Also the beetles and the butterflies and moths, particularly the butterflies and moths, because there are lots of people interested in recording butterflies and moths, not just in a couple of visits as, as Stephen Falk, but, but sort of long-term recording, Leslie Evans originally and other people later. So it's quite interesting to compare and certainly we're under-recorded in the hymenopterans. So let me look at the butterflies and moths first of all. Well, the majority of butterflies and moths, lepidopterans, are micro moths. They're very small and they're very hard to identify. So they're probably, generally speaking, under-recorded. But Les Evans, with some of his uh, colleagues and friends, did make, uh, do a lot of work trying to record these micro moths. Many of them, or some of them, well, actually many of them are very small and, and some of them are so small that caterpillars can actually live inside leaves. 
and they live between the upper and the lower surfaces of the leaves. So really tiny caterpillars which eat the leaves inside. And these are called mines. And you can often identify, not necessarily the exact species, but you can make a guess to the genus. The, the... So this, for example, Les Evans drew this. When you see a mine shaped like this, it would have started over here and the caterpillar is eating its way between the upper and the lower surface, getting bigger so the, the mine gets wider and then it pupates over here. It uh, spins a little cocoon inside the leaf or at that stage it sometimes bulges out and it turns into a tiny moth which mates, flies away, lays its eggs on another leaf and the whole process repeats itself. So you can sometimes identify them by the shape of the mines. The other thing you can do, which Les and colleagues did, is you can collect the leaves and with, with some plant material, keep them alive in water until the moths emerge, and then you can identify the adult moth. A lot of moth records are the result of light traps. And they've been run overnight by enthusiasts, a group of recorders in the park, but also during bio blitzes. On the Friday night, the rangers have camped in the park overnight and they've run light traps. And then in the morning, we've got a huge collection of moths that we tried to identify. Many moths that you catch are uh, what you could, if you were a bit negative, call little brown jobs. That is, they're small and they're sort of brown, browny black, pretty nondescript and not very easy to identify. A typical example um, is the garden grass veneer. And he here's a photo I got from Wikimedia Commons and I've seen these in light traps. Um, they're mm, less than a quarter of an inch. They're really quite small. and there are a lot of moths that look very similar to this. They're small, brown, not very easily distinguished. And I have to say, I don't have an eye for them, but there are some people um, who work in Sutton Park that really do and, and can look at them and, and quickly identify them. We find this one, the garden grass veneer, regularly. Um, its caterpillars feed on grass. Uh, its wingspan, when, it, when they're fully open, is about three quarters of an inch, which, but it's what, that will be about twice the length of the body. So they're, it's a bit bigger than some of them. Um, it, it's not one, one of the really small um, moths. Um, a much more colorful species that has been well recorded since at least 1965, initially by Les Evans, and then regularly in um, recent Sutton Park bio blitzes, is this one, the map-winged swift, which you know, I think is a rather beautiful moth. It's associated with bracken, of which there's plenty in the park, but its caterpillars also feed on other ferns and grasses. Um, here's another moth. Um, this is interesting. This is one that we first recorded from an overnight trap at the BioBlitz in 2017, and this photo that I got from Wikimedia Commons is interesting because what it shows, I think, is the, the, the photographer has luckily caught this moth on a rather orange colored bark. It, it looks to me like the bark of, of some kind of conifer. So the, the, but of the, the moth stands out, but you can imagine that if this were a dark brown colored um, bark, you'd, this would be superbly camouflaged. The six spot burnet, on the other hand, um, isn't something we catch in overnight traps because it's a day flying moth. Um, you see it out and about at the right time of the year in Sutton Park. Uh, it's a beautiful moth, uh, it, it, day flying. It'll be landing on flowers and feeding. Its food plant is the bird's foot trefoil and its wings have six spots in these three double spots. So it's quite easy to identify and these, these lovely red underwings. So something to look out for in, in the summer. The large skipper, again, is pretty common in the park, I would say. It, its food plant of its caterpillars is coxfoot grass and there's plenty of grass and 
quite a lot of cockspit grass as well in Sutton Park. Uh, it is actually a, a butterfly. If you know anything about butterflies and moths, one way of distinguishing them is that butterflies, the group called butterflies, have slightly clubbed ends to their antennae. And most butterflies, when they settle, either keep their wings outstretched or they fold them up um, above them. But the large skipper keeps its wings rather like a moth. So it, it's a much more moth-like looking um, butterfly. It's pretty common in the park, the large skipper. Well, just another example of a butterfly. This is the small copper. It's a very fast flying um, this is one of my own photos of fast flying species. I remember chasing this one until it settled and just about managing to get a photo rather hastily, which is why it isn't terribly sharp before it flew off again. Uh, again, it's reasonably common in the park in open areas because its larvae, its caterpillars feed on sorrels and docks and you know, there's plenty of sorrel and plenty of docks um, in the park. So there are lots of Butterflies are moths in the park, more moths than butterflies. Many of the moths are small, night flying, and you need a trap to catch them, but they're pretty well recorded. One of the specialities almost of Sutton Park is the holly blue. Because we have so many holly trees in the park and rather more than we should have, it's been increasing in recent years rather than decreasing. There are lots of holly blue butterflies and we sometimes get a real emergence of almost, almost vast numbers. There are other blue butterflies, but the holly blue is probably the commonest in the park. Right, true flies. This is the largest of the seven checklists on the web, even more than the um, butterflies, and particularly hoverflies, because as I've mentioned, more than once, Stephen Falk, who's run these two major invertebrate surveys in the park. He's the national expert, particularly on hoverflies, and he's written the standard British textbook of, on, on um, British hoverflies. True flies, we, we sometimes call things flies, like butterflies and other things are called flies, but they're not actually flies. True flies have only one pair of wings. Most insects have two pairs of wings, um, but true flies have only one pair. Well, not quite right. These little structures here, just here you can see, these are the remnants of what was once another pair of wings. They're called hull tears in the case of flies, and they're like little clubs on the end of stalks. It's thought that they are act a bit like gyroscopes in a, in a helicopter they, or in a plane, and they tell the fly which way it's moving and which way it's turning. Um, this is a crane fly, sometimes they're called daddy long legs. Um, it was recorded for the, well, it was recorded in the Victoria County history in 1904, and then nobody made any records of it again until the 2018-19, the very recent invertebrate survey. Um, crane flies, um, are their larvae um, are leather jackets. They, they live underground eating the roots of things, sometimes our lawns, and they emerge. There are quite a number of species. This one in Latin is called albipes, which means white leg. And you can see that these, this missing pair of wings here, the holtairs, are in this very long stalk. Um, a rather sinister looking fly, at least at this magnification. It's a bit bigger than a normal house fly, but it's not as enormous as the photo makes it. Um, this is the violet, well, it can be called different things, but a violet robber fly is, is one name of it. Um, it was recorded, first of all, in the 96-98 survey, but in the 2017 BioBlitz, school children found quite a lot of them. It must have been a, a time when they were very active. And its halter is rather this nice yellow color. It has these nice orange feet as well. Um, it's a very active predatory species that flies around um, uh, catching um, smaller insects and devouring them. Another interesting case is this species, which doesn't have an English name. Um, it was first recorded in the British Isles 
um, in 1885, it was the first British record of this species actually in Sutton Park. So R.C. Bradley found it in Sutton Park in 1885. And the original specimen, the actual specimen he caught, this isn't a picture of it, this is a finished specimen um, that I got off, off the internet, a photo of it. But the original specimen is in the British Museum and it's never been recorded in the park since. And there are no national records at the moment in what's called the National Biodiversity Network Atlas, which keeps notes of all the records. So did it only ever occur once in the park? Is it there now really and nobody's ever found it? Well, I don't know, it's interesting. Hoverflies are probably much more attractive um, insects to look at. Uh, and I mentioned repeatedly that that's what Stephen Falk is an expert on. Hoverflies, most of them are wasp or sometimes bee, but I think more wasp mimics. And you can see how this um, hoverfly um, is mimicking, look, the black and orange stripes, it mimics uh, a wasp. It's not a wasp, it's not dangerous, it won't sting you. Some of them, like this one, mimic bumblebees. And this has been recorded regularly from 1988 onwards and in the 2018 BioBlitz, school children caught, caught quite a few of them. And they're quite interesting because they have different color forms that mimic different kinds of um, bumblebees. One of the ways we know they're not bumblebees is because they have much, much larger eyes than bumblebees do. But if you look very closely, you would see they only had two, one pair of wings, two wings, and they have hole tears, but they're a bit hidden under the bristles. Okay, then there are other insects. What other insects are there? Well, there's a long list here of different groups. I'm going to pick a few examples from the yellow groups here. Damselflies and dragonflies. The, this damselfly, uh, the common blue damselfly, is probably the most one that's most recorded. Um, damselflies fold their wings back along their body when they um, are at rest. Then there's the emperor dragonfly here. Dragonfly is generally larger than damselflies and they hold their wings out when they're at rest. Interestingly, it was well recorded from 1965 to 2010, but we don't have any more recent records. That's not because it's not there, it's because nobody's bothered to make records, or at least if they have, they haven't told me about it and I can't put it on them, the web if I'm not told about them. True bugs. Uh, I suggest to most people, true bugs, um, that we often call all sorts of insects and creepy crawlies bugs, but true bugs um, are a different group. Um, they're not at all well recorded. This is the dock bug and we, it wasn't recorded till the 2018 bio blitz. It feeds on docks and sorrels, so it's quite common, but true bugs are under recorded. Any, anyone out there want to start collecting and recording bugs? Well, you'd be very welcome. Probably the most common beetle that school children find um, and bring back to us at bio blitzes is this one. Um, it, it's a very good nocturnal hunter. It, it, it's one, the violet ground beetle, it's sometimes called, it has different names. Um, it's good to have in your garden because it's a nocturnal hunter uh, and they will eat small slugs, the young of young slugs and young um, snails as well, which, which is, you know, for most of us, probably a good thing. Um, this is an interesting um, beetle, the, the four-banded longhorn. They're not horns, of course, they're antennae, but four orange bands. But we'll come back to this one. Its larvae um, live in a variety of trees, but we'll come back to that one. The green tiger beetle is often seen running about on open sandy paths in the summer on Heathland on a nice sunny day when they're very active. You can't really mistake them, this, this rather beautiful metallic green. This is the Harlequin ladybird. As far as I'm aware, the first actual record, I'm sure it was there before, but nobody seems to have made a record of it until I photographed it in March, 2017 in a crack in that wooden sculpture that stands in the triangle um, near town gate. And there was a crack and I saw them. They probably were sheltering there. Maybe they'd been there all winter, I don't know. There are two color forms here, but they're the same species. The Harlequin ladybird was originally from East Asia. 
It wasn't seen in the UK in the wild until 2004. And since then it's spread widely and it outcompetes native ladybirds. It's larger and it's quite voracious. It, it eats, you know. I think it was introduced into glass houses to control um, pests, but it escaped. Okay, hymenopterans, ants, bees, wasps, sawflies, Solitary parasitic wasps make up most of this group, but they're very under-recorded in the park because they're mostly small and they're very hard to identify. Some estimates suggest that there are 650,000 species of parasitic wasps worldwide. There are certainly well over 17,000 different species in the UK. In many species, the females lay their eggs in the larvae in the caterpillars or whatever, or even in the eggs of an unwitting host. And then the wasps young develop inside the host and consume it alive from the inside out until they burst out. Not very pleasant. Um, this was quite an interesting one. It was an outdoor meeting of the Sutton Coldwood Natural History Society to which we'd invited some other societies. And our, one of our members, Richard Saul, we saw this wasp and Richard Saul, one of our members, took some photographs of it. And because it, they were good photographs, there were more than this, I managed to get it identified by Gavin Broad at the Natural History Museum. And there are very few recent national records of this species that never before been recorded in the park. Uh, indeed, none that is a family called Braconidae and none of them have ever been recorded in the park. And there are hardly any national records of it either. So, Presumably it's still there, but we've never seen it since, although we have looked. And in fact, what was going on was, as far as we can make out, the wasp was following the beetle that I've shown you before. The beetle was laying eggs. This is its ovipositor, the, the structure that the female uses to lay eggs. And it lays them in cracks in this stump. And what, what we think is happening is the, the wasp is following the beetle and using its antennae to try and locate the eggs that the beetle has laid and then it uses this long ovipositor to push its eggs inside or near or inside the eggs of the beetle and we found out later that this wasp species was known actually to parasitize this beetle species. Bumblebees are a member of this group, they're often caught by school children, they're probably familiar to most people, this is the early bumblebee, um, there are also cuckoo bees. Um, these are like cuckoo birds. The, the female lays its eggs in the nest of a normal bumblebee, an ordinary bumblebee, and then it just leaves their workers to rear its offspring, and it goes off and lays some more if it can find another nest. Um, so it, it's like a cuckoo. Um, the tree bumblebee is a Eurasian species that spread into the UK since about 2001. And we first recorded it in the park in 2016. Again, it may have been there before. It's very attractive, bumblebee, black, white, black, and this very gingery, orangey, and quite large. Snails are very under-recorded in the park. This tiny little snail was first collected in 1894 and again in 1898 by Overton. It's never recorded again until 2018-19. Again, not because it wasn't there, but because it's not been recorded. School children have been very good at finding centipedes and millipedes during bio blitzes, but we haven't always been able to identify them. This is one we can identify, uh, Lithobius forficatus. It doesn't seem to have an English name. It was recorded quite often, but there are more, certainly more centipedes and millipedes in the park if anyone is ever interested in recording them. I'm not going to say much about birds because I hope you will be able to have a talk from Martin Fisher at some time in the future and he knows much more about birds of the park than I do. However, even in this well-recorded group there's a scope for extra records. The lesser spotted woodpecker hasn't been recorded in the park since 1997, but has it been there? I suspect it has. Fish are well recorded if they interest anglers. So pike, for example, have been recorded from 1896 onwards. The largest known specimen ever caught in the park weighed 26 pounds, 12 kilos. And there are pike in the right pools. The school children, when they do pond dipping, which I mentioned before, often find the three-spined stickle bat and the males develop rather red bellies in the breeding season and they're very attractive. 
Amphibians, well found in the park, common frogs, common toads, well, they are common in the park. And tiny little froglets are often swarming everywhere. You don't often see a toad in the water, you more often see it on the land, whereas frogs are a bit more aquatic, but they're both aquatic amphibians. Reptiles, the um, viviparous lizard that gives birth to live young, it's regularly seen and recorded in the park, especially in open, sunny, sandy areas. Barred grass snakes, the, the, common, the only grass snake normally found in the UK, they're, they're often seen by people and recorded in the park. They're good swimmers and you, they're regularly seen by water. The color and the pattern are very variable. They can have much darker markings than this, but this color, white, cream, yellow color is very distinctive. Adders, I've no longer recorded in the park. There are some specimens in the Birmingham Museum collections, which were collected in 1940. Um, although rangers have put down sheets of um, uh, zinc covered tin and put down sacks that they might gather underneath and people have looked, we haven't found any adders in the park. Bats, mammals now, bats. Um, Bat walks taking place after dark, um, partly as part of BioBlitz and special ones, have recorded lots of bats. They're usually heard rather than seen. You can't, most people, well, humans can't hear bats most of the time because their sounds are too high for our ears, but you can get special bat detectors that convert the um, sounds to a lower frequency. And this one, Dorbenton's bat, is often seen flying over the pools. It's a big bat as bats go with a wingspan up to about 11 inches. Stoats and weasels, weasels and stoats do occur in the park. They've been recorded since 1896, but they're not common. Um, weasels feed, feed mainly on mice and voles. Stoats prefer rabbits. And because rabbit numbers fluctuate a lot, they're currently down due to disease, then the number of stoats is going to be well down as well. But if the rabbits, um, increased in number, then so would stoats. Red squirrels. Well, they were once common in the park. When Howard and I first worked on the records of the animals of the park, and we put the checklist online, we didn't know when they disappeared. And then uh, a former Sutton Caulfield resident who was then, well, at the time, I guess he still does, living in Sweden, who'd seen the website, emailed us to say he still had these nature diaries from when he was young. And uh, he'd actually recorded one, he wrote in his diary at the time at Bracebridge near the dam on November the 23rd, 1957, eating cones and in full red coat with long ear tufts. It was only about hundred yards away from a gray squirrel. And that's the last known record at present. So red squirrels would have been common in the park over a very long time until as far as we know, 1957. The only deer recorded in the park regularly, native actually living there, in a sense native to the park, is the muntjac, which came, it's an alien, it came from southeast China in the first place. It's very rarely seen. It's more often heard barking or identified through footprints in mud. Um, we do sometimes get red deer and, and roe deer and fallow deer. Adult males in the rutting season wander around trying to find females and we think they come down the railway line, but they never stay in the park. There are too many dogs around perhaps and it's just not a suitable habitat. But there are definitely muntjac, which are seen rarely, but they're heard barking or footprints. So that's my quick skip through uh, some of the animal records in the park. I don't have to tell most of you that there's much that remains wonderful about Sutton Park, but some of its habitats and hence its wildlife do face an uncertain future. There's increasing pollution of all kinds in the park um, in, in, and there's global climate change affecting, it's definitely changing the climate in changing things. And as I said at the beginning, records are important because they provide evidence they prove continually to people how valuable the park is, but they also show us how it's changing. And they help us both in obtaining the status of the park and its current management. And long may, I'm sure you all agree with me, that long may the park and its wonderful wildlife continue to exist. 
and, and delight its many visitors. I can only say here, here, Peter, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you for a, a fascinating talk and uh, some marvellous photographs in there as well. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are joining me in, in thanking very warmly Peter uh, for his talk this evening. It's It's been fascinating and I'm sure it's made us all eager, even in this uh, slightly nippy weather, to get out to the park as soon as possible to uh, to spot um, whether they're micro moths and and the uh, um, tunneling in the leaves um, or uh, some of the the larger animals. Uh, so um, yes, uh, thank you, Peter. It's been a real pleasure having you join us. And otherwise, I hope you will stay safe and stay well. I hope you have a wonderful December. And um, fingers crossed, we will be continuing uh, this online series uh, of local interest talks next year, um, but uh, more. Uh, anon on that when when details have been finalized so thanks very much everybody good night <laughs>